Hello everyone, today I've got an exciting guest. It's Dr. Monica Johnson. She's the host of The Savvy Psychologist. And today we're gonna be talking about how to use a DBT skill for when you're in crisis. So I'm super excited to have her. Let's jump in. All right. Thank you, Dr. Johnson, so much for being here. I'm super excited to talk with you about a DBT skill and how to manage crises using some kind of really hands-on skills. So thank you so much for being here. Yeah, I'm excited to talk with you today. Awesome. Cool. Well, could you start off by telling us about what is DBT? When is it helpful? How can you use it? Yeah, so DDT stands for Dialectical Behavior Therapy, and it was originally developed by a psychologist, Marsha Linehan, to help with borderline personality disorder. But over time, we recognize that it works for basically anyone who has difficulty with emotion regulation. So if you have a mood disorder like depression, if you struggle with anxiety, even people who have PTSD, eating disorders, anger, I could go on and on about the yeah. things that DBT can actually be effective for. That's awesome. And and one of the things I really like about DBT is it's just so like practical. It's like, here is a skill you can use when this happens, right? Yeah, yeah. And so that is really one of the cornerstones of DBT is that we do help people in a lot of different ways in terms of when you have an in the moment situation or crisis that you need skills for, we give you skills for that. But in doing and learning about dialectics, we also help you to like have a different worldview and perspective and like tackle and approach and visualize problems in different ways too. A lot of times we don't recognize that our reaction to something is what's causing the problem and not necessarily the thing in front of us. The situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I like that about DBT. Now, a dialectic, that's kind of a big word. That kind of means like understanding the two sides of something. Is that right? Right. And so with dialectics, what we, one of the things that we're understanding is that like living in extremes creates problems, right? And in choosing to think about things dialectically, what we're trying to do is understand that there's truth in both sides of the extremes. So for instance, if you go to the gas station and all of a sudden gas is like $10, like, you know, you understand that like, I need gas and gas is expensive, <laughs> you know? And both of these things are true the same time. Yeah. You know what I mean? I can be upset about this like duality or I can I can accept that like gas is really expensive and I have to figure out how to afford it and like focus on the actual synthesis or moving forward on that issue because it's, maybe I can't change the fact that I need gas and maybe I can't change the fact that it's expensive, but I can figure out how to get my car from A to B if I don't get caught up on those two extremes. Yeah. Ooh, I like that. I like that a lot. And and I can think about a lot of situations where someone might be experiencing really intense emotions. Something might feel super, oh, just so intense and they'd be inclined to be reactive. Maybe they're in crisis or they're going to, they just want to blow up or scream or yell or even engage in some self-harm or uh, a self-sabotaging behavior like substance use. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about how to use some DBT skills in crisis, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think if people don't realize when you're in that fight, flight, freeze response, when you're anxious, stressed, scared, worried, your brain is more likely to think in absolutes. Like you're, it actually impacts, like how your body is impacts your thinking patterns. Oh, absolutely. And that that's actually a good segue into one of the skills that I wanted to talk about today, which is in DBT, we call it the, the tip skill. And it's a really good skill for manipulating your body chemistry in, in, in certain moments. Okay. So something like the tip skill is really good when you are feeling a lot of that like physical anxiety, physical crises. You can feel your mind just going a million times a minute. Like the tip skill is going to be really good. And what tip stands for is temperature, intense exercise, paired breathing or progressive muscle relaxation. And I'll go through each of those different pieces. Um, the first one, temperature, is one that I actually really love. 
And something that I explain to people is you're an animal and don't ever forget that. <laughs> you know, and, and that's one of the reasons why this skill works is it taps into our mammalian diving response. Yeah. And so with the tip skill, basically what you're going to be trying to do, and there's a few different ways you can do it. The most common way that people do is they will fill up a steak or fill up a large bowl with cold water. And some people will want to put ice and things in the water. And you can do that if you have heart conditions or anything like that. Talk to your, your doctor because one of the things we're doing with temperature is we're slowing down your heart rate and we're going to do it pretty quickly. And so what you would do is fill up the bowl or fill up the sink with cold water. You lean over and submerge your face in the water. And normally, you you know, people will do this for about 30 seconds or so. If you can't hold your breath for a full 30 seconds, then you come up, get a sip of air, and then go back down into the water. So that's one way to do it. You can also do this by putting like an ice pack or a cold towel like on your face and leaning over. And then a third way that you can do it is just leaning over and splashing water on your face. All of us have watched movies where people <laughs> lean yeah. over and splash cold water on their face. Yeah. And so these are all methods that you can do. The splashing the water on the face isn't gonna work as well as the fully submerging your, your face in the water to calm down. And I'm gonna explain a little bit more about why that is. Yeah. So I've already mentioned the mammalian diving response. And basically what occurs for a mammal is when we dive into deep, cold water, you know, our body naturally slows down our heart rate, slows down our respiration, and all of these things in order to prepare us to be under the water for longer periods of time. Mm -hmm. And so this is one of the ways you can hack your system. Because think about what happens when you're in a crisis. In a crisis, heart rate goes up, respiration goes up, and everything's going up. Mm -hmm. And so you can tap into that mammalian diving response by using one of these three methods to equalize things and start to bring you back down. And so normally what'll happen after you use the temperature is people will feel a little more calm than what they did before. And kind of what we talked about, that flexibility, it just creates that space that now I can think of well, what is the next thing I need to do to like help myself. Now that my brain's not moving at a million miles a minute, is there another skill I can do to even help myself further than using the temperature in this way? Cool. And yeah, so, I love it. Yeah. And so that's the temperature one. Love it. Okay. What's the eye? Tell us about the eye. Yeah. So the eye is intense exercise. Mm -hmm. And when I talk to people about intense, I'm like, again, you're the starting point for intense. You know, intense, if you don't work out, intense is not like doing a CrossFit workout. Right. It's something that feels difficult for you and like gets your heart rate up. And so another thing that obviously happens, we've already talked about how when you're in a crisis, everything gets revved up, right? Sometimes that can land in our body as kind of this energy, this agitated kind of energy. And so I like the, the eye and tip for those kind of moments. And it doesn't have to be a long amount of exercise. It doesn't have to be like a full 45 minute workout. It can literally be, I'm going to take 60 seconds and do jumping jacks Yeah, because yeah. I need to get this energy like out of my system or, you know, I'm in New York city. So I would always tell people like, go do the stairs, you know, like just go and go up and down a few flights of stairs and you'll probably help to burn up that energy. Because I think a lot of times people don't realize, particularly when you're in a panic attack and things like that, you're having adrenaline dump and all of this other stuff. And like, you need to like get through that energy. And that's why it feels bad. It's because like, yeah. this is what your body is doing is it's saying, oh, there's a bear. Let's dump all of this energy into you because you need to be able to run really fast or something. And it's like, in our modern day society, it's not a bear that is freaking us out. It's a presentation I have to do for work. Like yeah. that's the thing. And that makes, it really, mess on it. makes it really hard to discharge that physical energy that your body's ready, just primed, ready to explode with, right? Yeah. Right. And so it's like, we got to get rid of it. And one of the ways to get rid of it is intense exercise. Because if you just yeah. sit there with it, it just feels 
awful. (laughs) You can feel the tingling under your skin. Like there's just so many things that happen during that. And some aspect of it is natural and normal. It's just happening at a time, which is like entirely ineffective. Totally. Totally. Okay. So intense exercise. So doing the stairs, jumping jacks, do something. Yeah. Mm Push-ups, doing squats, like anything. You could go for a walk. You know, whatever it is, but you got to like burn through the the energy that you have in your system. Yeah, I like that. I like that. And again, I like reminding the audience that these are good short term in a crisis. And in the long run, if that's your only skill, people can develop like exercise dependence, right? Or eating disorder Mm -hmm. types. So it's like we got to also learn how to solve problems. The goal of these skills is to get us calm enough and get us through the situation so that we don't do something really stupid or make things worse. And then we can come back to a problem, face it and solve it, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So it's giving us that room to make it through the critical moment so we can come back and do the work that like needs to be done in this situation for sure. Yeah. And that's setting boundaries or solving a problem or looking at your calendar and taking things out of your calendar or whatever it is, you know? Yeah. In fact, for a lot of people, if they're having like frequent crises, you know, I'm always like, okay, yeah, but what are the events leading up to it? You know, because we're not here to just tackle problems. We're here to prevent problems if we can, yeah. you know, and that, that leads to always be our goal. Great. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And so, so then we get to the P's and the P's stand for two different things, like paired breathing and also progressive muscle relaxation. So probably a lot of people know about breathing exercises, mindfulness exercises, and those sorts of things. And sometimes people really minimize the power of the breath. But again, when we mention like respiration going up and things like that, well, that's your breath. <laughs> like, and, and how you breathe can also change your experience of a panic attack or a crisis moment. And in fact, a lot of people hyperventilate or they engage in very shallow breathing when they're upset. And something that I try to explain to people is when you don't have your normal kind of respiration rate, it's like, well, is oxygen even having enough time to get through your whole body if you're, you know, all the time like hyperventilating or if you have very shallow breathing? And so if you're not getting oxygen through your whole body, well, then your body is like, we're suffocating. And then your body is going to freak out, which just means that it's going to hide you. (laughs) That is the situation that I'm in. Exactly. And so, you know, I always tell people don't minimize the power of the breath. It's important to find different types of breathing exercises that really work for you in these sorts of situations. And then if uh, I would say if relaxation breathing isn't the easiest thing for you to do, then you can swoop over into like progressive muscle relaxation or even other types of mindfulness. So like maybe doing more gratitude based mindfulness or things like that. Because I do know I get I sometimes get patients who they're like, the moment you tell me to breathe, I can't breathe. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And so then what I try to do is we don't have to focus on the breath. We can focus on other aspects of mindfulness. And then the breath will probably catch up with it. So like if I'm doing a loving kindness meditation with myself, or if I'm just using like soundscapes like rain or something, and I'm just focusing my mindful attention on that, probably my breathing is going to like get in line because I'm focusing in on something that is just naturally more calming for me. And so it's important for people to kind of be open-minded about pulling in the right types of breathing exercises for themselves. I also like to let people know that breathing exercises don't have to be long, you know, even just doing it for one minute can be enough to start to like bring things down. Or if you were to coach someone into paired breathing, what do you mean by that specifically? Like on a practical level, what would you coach them to do? Sure, sure, sure. So with the paired breathing, there's certain components. The basic component is just One, how to do deep breathing. Because a lot of people don't know how to do that. And so normally what I will tell people to do is to make a diamond around your belly button. So take your hands and put them together and put them around your belly button. And when you breathe in deep, you should just feel your hand move. Mm -hmm. You know, and it doesn't have to be like a huge move, but you should feel it just rise a little bit. What happens sometimes people start breathing from up in their chest. 
And I don't want you breathing from your chest when we're doing deep breathing exercises. I want you to fill up your lungs. And if you're filling up your lungs, you're going to fill that in your lower belly. So this is just what we would call belly breathing as like a basic kind of breathing thing. So mm -hmm. that can be all you do. And like that can be helpful. Mm -hmm. And so that would be like kind of the foundation. And then you can pair other things on top of it, depending on what you like. Um, I really like to do deep breathing and then do straw breaths is what I call them, where I purse my lips and then it forces you to kind of blow out evenly and slowly. And so that's really calming for my system. So I enjoy those. Some people en um, enjoy what we call alternate nostril breathing. So they'll hold one nostril and breathe in and let it out. And then they'll switch and do the other one. And, and doing that, some people will start to even notice that their breath is different on one side and then the other. <laughs> and so, yeah. And so you do kind of start to figure out and get, I guess, more of a relationship with your breath, yeah. which is something good to have in a lot of different situations. I love it. I love it. And from a nervous system perspective, these are all turning on that parasympathetic response. Yes. That suit yeah. in your body's natural calming response. Yeah, because they can't both be active at the same time. And so it's like, you know, if I'm trying to turn off the sympathetic, I got to turn on. <laughs> but it's not so sympathetic. You have to do. Yeah, it's an active, yeah. an active step. Yeah. That's awesome. That's great. Great advice. Okay. And then you said you were, you were moving into, before I interrupted you, progressive muscle relaxation. Yeah. So progressive muscle relaxation, you, when you do that, you also do that with the deep breathing or the paired breathing as well. And with that, what you're doing is you're tensing and relaxing different muscle groups. Because another thing that's true with panic and also with crises is we carry a lot of tension in our bodies. You know, for me, it's my shoulders. Like my shoulders, they're never relaxed. Whenever I see my personal trainer, they're like, relax your shoulders. And I'm like, I don't know. Okay, what that means, I don't think my shoulders have ever been relaxed. <laughs> You're like making me think about how tight my shoulders are right now. And I'm like, okay, let's do this. Let's get to the relax them. Well, and this is another thing in terms of being aware of your own body and system. These are the types of things we'll swipe left on, right? Because you're so used to carrying the tension in your shoulders that you're like, oh, whatever. But like, what if I just took a, like a minute or two and just said, okay, I'm going to tense. And with using the shoulders specifically, tensing them means pulling them up to your ears and holding them there while you're doing. And then with the deep breathing on the out breath, what I usually like to do is say relax to myself and then slowly let the tension just like melt. And like, this is usually the only moment that I get to feel what my shoulders feel like relaxed because I'm being very intentional about it. And when I let out that out breath really slow, and I'm saying that relaxed to myself in my mind, I really intentionally let my shoulders drop so I can feel that kind of relief sensation. It's very hard to describe in words, you know, what it is, but you do feel like the difference of like, oh, wait, like this is relaxed. <laughs> Right. And it's funny because we like, if you're sitting there tense and you just think relax, you're like, what does that even mean? I can't like, but there's something about leaning into it and then loosening that you can kind of get a better feel for what that's like, right? Absolutely. And you can do progressive muscle relaxation from your fingers to your toes. Like you can tense your feet and relax them. The face is always a really comical thing to do. <laughs> and a lot of people carry a lot of tension in their face too, in your jaw, in your forehead. I've caught myself in times where I've gotten in a car and my brow is furrowed and I'm just like, and I'm looking in the windshield like, <laughs> was I like this all day? Is it not like, you know, and so I will even say too, when we're talking about kind of these, these unaware crisis states that we can be in that we swipe left on, like sometimes people can be reacting to you poorly and you don't know why. And it's because you've been walking around from so like, <laughs> like looking, right, stank face all day, you know, and then people don't know how to take it. And, you know, but I, but I've had times where like I had that stank face and then I'll just sit for a minute and I relax my facial muscles. And then I do that and I'm like, oh my God, I feel so much more calm, letting the forehead drop, letting the jaw kind of like relax and just feeling that kind of sensation. Just thinking about relaxing is making me yawn a little bit. And it, just thinking about it and like 
my face. Like when I touch my face and think about relaxing my face, I yawn a little bit, which it means you just talking about relaxing is triggering my parasympathetic response just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so, yeah, that's one of the ways. And, and for anyone who's new with progressive muscle relaxation, there's lots of tutorials on how to do it. You can find scripts that kind of talk you through how to tense and relax like each individual muscle, you know, and it's, Again, it's something that anybody can do. Great. Love it. That's awesome. Okay. Well, thanks so much for sharing that with us. The tip skill. It's really yeah, I, something handy people can take with them for moments of crisis. Yeah. And, you know, depending on what you're into, you can use all parts of it. You can kind of say, oh, I'm a temperature fan, <laughs> you know? And so, yeah, it, it provides you with something regardless of kind of where you're at in your crisis survival skills. Great. I love it. Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson, for joining us today. Really excited to learn more uh, of these skills with you and really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay.